Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins. By virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak the intro. It. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, my trust. because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. no evil shall be allowed to befall you. You will tread on the lion and the adder. When he calls to me, I will answer him. With long life, I will satisfy him. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. <clears throat> the Old Testament reading for in vocabit that is, the first Sunday in Lent, is written in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. 
He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the servant, serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. God. The epistle is written in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the author of Hebrews. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, how does God defend and help you against all evil? This morning we consider the text from Hebrews and also consider Jesus' high priestly office. That might be theological jargon for you now, but hopefully by the end of the sermon your faith is strengthened by this duty, this office that Jesus currently is doing for you. A few weeks ago, we meditated on the parable of the sower, uh, God's word being that seed. But we also remembered that there is plenty of adversity and affliction that each of us goes through in life. Whether it's the devil that literally tries to take the gospel from your hearts so that you perish and go to hell, or it's your own sinful nature that you grapple with that can dry up your faith and lead you away from the church or the world. And it's many different riches and poverty that will soon get you to care for things in place of or instead of God and His Word. We all do battle against the devil, and our own sin, each other's sin, and the world. Uh, just look at the devil. Remember, he is that pictured as a, a lion prowling after you. In just a few seconds, he gets Eve to turn quickly against God's word onto her own desire for knowledge, and Adam too. And if the devil's going to go after Jesus albeit Jesus who's fasted and in the desert and weakened. But if the devil's going to go after Jesus and think he can actually fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, then you can bet that the devil's going to come after you, thinking you are an easy target. The devil doesn't fear you on your own. Let us... I don't have to do any convincing that the world is not a, a great place for you. But let us just think about that for a moment. What is your greatest temptation? I mean, the thing that causes you to, to doubt or the thing that is the easiest method of, of sinning for you, however great or repetitive it might be. Cursing, lying, cheating, Hatred or lack of love for a particular neighbor or person. Loving money too much so you, you fail to be a good steward for your neighbor or for God. Are you worried about UFOs? <laughs> China, Russia, our own country. Have you hurt someone in your family who fails to talk to you? Have you let someone in your family down? Do you fail to pray or fail to pray for others? Would you even tell anyone if you did have this problem? Would you even tell your pastor in private confession? Or do you not trust God's means of forgiveness for those sins that trouble your heart and your conscience? No, I don't need to convince you this world's a tough place and that you grapple with certain sins. This isn't to ignore all of God's countless blessings, but we can't also ignore the problems that we face and our need for God's help. Our need for God's defense for us. If Christians were saying way back, when the Psalms were written that God is our mighty fortress 
And if Christ comes to do battle against the devil to defend us in his incarnation, also, we need help. I, I have a suspicion that's what you're doing here. Not only to praise God, but also for God to help you in your life. And this morning, we read in Hebrews that God is defending you still. Hebrews 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in every respect who has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in help of need. God wants to be clear that you have a high priest. And when he describes Jesus as your high priest, he almost does a summary of the creed there and packages it all in just a few little verses of all the things that we confess Jesus does for us as the Son of God, right? Tempted as we are, sympathizes with our weaknesses. Jesus, who was humiliated in his incarnation, that is, became man, took on our flesh, was crucified, suffered, buried under Pontius Pilate, right? And then Hebrews also describes how Jesus passed through the heavens, that is, his ascension, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now, you say these words all the time. Do they bear weight in your life? Do they comfort you? Because they are the heart of the gospel. They are the heart and the most comforting thing that we could really confess God's ever done for us. Do you think about that? If we stop and thought and meditated on what Christ does and is still doing, all oh, the amount of comfort we have in the shield of faith to defend us against the devil and our sin and the world's misleading and misguiding us. Today, I really want you to go away and understand Jesus' high priestly office and have it comfort and strengthen your faith. Now, a prophet speaks to men on behalf of God, but a priest speaks to God on behalf of men. A prophet is God's ambassador to men. A priest is man's ambassador to God. So it is a priest that would bring sacrifices to God's temple and to his altar in order to speak or forgive or have God then respond through the priest to forgive or bless his people. All other priests in the Old Testament, would first have to purify themselves. They'd have to wash and make sure they have the right clothes on. They would have to make sure the sacrifice was right. And before they ever spoke on behalf of men to God, they would make sure they themselves were clean and pure, or else they have no business speaking to God. But you don't have a priest that has to go through all of that. You have the great high priest who is and has been tempted in every respect yet without sin. The priest who speaks to God on your behalf has no sin to pure, need purification for himself. He intercedes completely for you, not for himself. He is the one interceding completely for you. So then, that is to cause you to draw near to the throne of grace and pray all the more that you have an ambassador, mediator, an intercessor exalted with the Father for you. 
Hebrews 4 is not the only place that speaks of this. It's quite common in the scripture to assure you of Jesus intercession or speaking on man's behalf to God the Father. Hebrews 7, Jesus lives to make intercession for Christians. Or 1 John 2, which we speak in the Matin service, we have an advocate with the Father. Isn't that beautiful? We have an advocate, one who befriends, advocates, speaks on behalf. Romans 8, who is to condemn you? Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that who is raised, is at the right hand of God. He makes intercession for you. Paul is so clear about Jesus' priestly office on your behalf that he says, no one can condemn a Christian. Yes, you sin, but if Christ has paid for that sin, if Christ is speaking to God on your behalf, then no one can condemn you. There is no condemnation for the believer in heaven. Only blessing, only forgiveness, only mercy and grace. Before I apply this, I want you to take one more thought and reflection of how important this is. To think of all of your temptations, all of your worst moments, all of your troubles, your impending death, taxes owed last year and taxes to be owed this year, all the things that threaten you and your loved ones, your kids and your grandkids, your family and your friends, our nation and our church. Think of all the threats of sin, death, and the devil. And remember, Christ knows them all. And right now, he is interceding for you so that God would defend you against them all. Think about that next time you pray for help. Jesus is already hearing and advocating for everything you ask in his name. Think about that next time you get sick or you're scared or worried, whether it's UFOs or another country. Think about that next time temptation grabs hold of you and you have the choice to choose good or evil. Jesus, in his high priestly office, is interceding, advocating, and praying for you. Now, to apply this, I thought of a number of ways, but what about this scenario? Think of Christ in his high priestly office as his work after his cross. He didn't just die and was buried and then he paid for your sins and that's it. He's still actively working, actively praying. Like, I don't know, like if you were 16, you just got your driver's license and mom and dad hand you the keys. So you go out for your first time by yourself, pick up your best buddy, and temptation gets the best of you, <laughs> and the pedal goes to the metal. And you and your buddy are having a great time, and finally freedom, and life seems better than it's ever been, and then all of a sudden you see the flashing lights in your rear view mirror. <laughs> now <laughs> it goes from great to horrible, and you pull over to this shoulder and think, it's all over. A ticket that I can't pay, mom and dad are going to ground me, every freedom that I just had is out the door, and when the officer pulls up and asks you to roll down your window, he doesn't come to throw you in jail or write you a ticket, but instead, your best friend takes the fall. Your best friend says, I was the one driving, and the officer goes along with it. The officer says, yeah, I'll charge your speeding ticket to your friend. Now it's not yours to repay and not your guilt to stand before your parents. And the officer will even go and testify the same to the judge. Do you see how gracious Christ is? 
for he is both friend and advocate. He's both the one that took the fall and the one who intercedes on your behalf before your heavenly father. And not just for one crime, but for all of your sins, from the greatest to the least, and every day in between, Jesus is the one who vouched for you and paid what you owe to heaven. Either you have this great sacrifice as priest who died on the cross and advocates for you, or you don't. Either way, it's, it's God the one who is saving you. God the one that came to your defense long before you were born to pay. And God who still lives, risen, ascended, who advocates and speaks on your behalf now. To assure you of this and assure his father of this, the very holes that bore him to the cross are still in his hands as proof of his payment for your sin. Do not forget Jesus who prays and speaks to the Father for you now. So many people misunderstand God is one purely of law. He'll bust you when you're wrong and slightly reward you when you do good. But this misses the mark. We have a God who's not only for the law and upholds right and wants all to love, but we have a God also of the gospel. He is a God who puts his foot down against all sin, but also puts his foot on the cross to pay for all sin. Jesus is that advocate. He is our mediator. He is even the one who's not just an officer with a badge, but one who has lived and walked in your shoes. And the scripture says, one who is, has endured all temptation yet without sin. Indeed, one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Sympathio. That's not just sympathy like, yeah, I feel ya. I can imagine what you've gone through. No. Sympathio is sympathy that is literally with suffering. It's not that Jesus just kind of understands what you're going through in the world. No. Jesus has faced all temptation and is without sin. He is the man all the world turned on, denied, deserted, hated, murdered on the cross, forsaken by his Father so that the Father would never forsake you. Jesus doesn't just have an idea of your suffering. Jesus knows it all. He is the suffering servant. He's not just the God of the law, an officer with a badge to throw you in the slammer. He is the man who knows and understands everyone's suffering. When you understand this, it's not a matter of praying to God whether he knows your needs and suffering. Rather, it's far more a matter of you understanding Christ has endured all temptation and is without sin. So rather, it's a matter of you understanding his suffering what he paid and won for you. You have just a smidgen of the amount of suffering Christ has undergone. Knowing this, you take up your cross and you see how Christ endured all trials. And you see how he bails you out of all sin. This is his priestly office. He performs it right now, advocating for you. We can take this great comfort with us and know Jesus not only has fulfilled the law, but right now prays and knows our needs, or we can just let it go. Just move on with our life and try to repent as we have been doing. 
Of course, that's not the answer. Take to heart not only Christ's cross, but his current, his current work right now. Or we can dabble with false doctrine and lead ourselves even further away, saying, oh, this sacrament's no big deal, what we believe or confess. We could even dabble with a re-sacrifice of an unbloody Christ, where the pastor plays the priest, re-offering Jesus to the Father as if the work of man could be offered to God to satisfy sin. Never should you understand me as your priest, because I cannot bear the law or offer anything to God on your behalf. This is why we call our ministers of the word pastors, not priests. Because Christ is the great high priest, his intercession, his work, his sacrifice takes away your sin, not man's. Here, what we do is not re-offer Jesus. He was offered once for all. Rather, what we receive is the word, the body, the blood of Christ, which is given and shed by Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins. This meal, this sacrament changes you, for your faith is wholly on Christ, not any of our work, and he commands us to do it so that our faith would ever remain on Christ, our great high priest. Or we could dabble with the intercession of the saints and think that those who have died are in heaven praying and thinking and intercessing for us as if along with Jesus. As if to say, when you were driving and got that speeding ticket, there was a third party who saw the crime and goes along with the story of the officer and your friend so that your parents and the judge would more fully believe the officer in, on duty. How silly is this? Why would the father, who loves the son, sent the son to the cross, helped rise the Son from the dead, dwells with the Son forever, need anything more than the Son's testimony and intercession. Either the Father counts Jesus' sacrifice and intercession as worthy or not. But Mary and other saints are not going to make God love Jesus or his word more. The high priestly intercession places our faith solely in God, so we don't trust in our or other saints' merits so that we're heard. We trust in Christ. He is our intercessor. His work is perfect for you, and so is his intercession. God hears you because of Christ every day, no matter what trial, temptation, or suffering, he has suffered. He knows your needs, and you pray to God and are heard perfectly through the forgiveness Christ has won. All this Jesus does for you now to bring help and defense for you today so that he will bring you through the heavens to his eternal home and the kingdom ours remaineth. In the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. O Lord, you sought Adam and Eve in the garden and called them to repentance. Seek us when we wander from your word and give us contrite hearts to confess our sins and receive the forgiveness you have won. Lord, in your mercy. Father, your Son trampled the serpent underfoot and freed us from sin and death by his cross. He advocates for us now, ascended at your right hand. Protect and preserve your church and all her members. For Christians struggling with temptation or doubt, command your angels to guard us in all their ways and bear us up in the name of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you created the home and the family as the place where we are brought up in the ways of truth, goodness, and mercy. Sustain parents in their sacred charge. Grant that our homes would be places of confession, forgiveness, and where your name is praised and prayed daily. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you establish earthly authorities to punish evil and praise those who do good. Grant our rulers humble hearts to resist the allure of power. Grant defense for our law officers, emergency workers, and all those who serve the public good, that they would be protected in their duties and uphold that which is right and true. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your Son was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to suffer temptation for our behalf. Strengthen us when we are tempted and teach us to rely on your word as our defense against the evil one. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we, sent, we pray for help for those in need of sickness or who are troubled. All those whose names have been asked for intercession. We pray for Butch Barnes, Mike Getty, Bernice Gromans, Arlen Grobengeiser, Lillian Grobengeiser, Luella Rubin, Steve Velker, Jean Wharton. We pray for those grieving Marcella, who has now passed through the heavens and dwells with you in the soul. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, give us repentance and faith to receive your Son's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you've given us a refuge from the world in the body of Christ. Protect us from all evils of body and soul to find rest in this life and eternal rest in your heavenly embrace. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary, we at all times and places. Give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as ransom for many that with cleansed hearts we may be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying...
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you of your mercy, you strengthen us in the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Peace.